All right, so today's question investigates when we're given a number n, how many structurally unique binary search trees can we construct from the set of numbers from 1 to n? So if n is 3, I'm only going to get the numbers 1, 2, and 3. How many structurally unique binary search trees can I create with the numbers 1, 2, and 3? Three nodes, numbers 1, 2, and 3. Again, binary search trees, everything on our left subtree is going to have to be less than the node we're sitting at. Everything in our right subtree is going to have to be greater than the node we're sitting at. So why is this important? This is actually a very important sequence in combinatorics. And these set of numbers that this problem produces from its input of n forms the Catalan sequence or what's called the Catalan numbers. And these are actually very useful in combinatorics. I'll link below if you want to learn more about that. But let's see how we can approach this question. And I really want you to see the approach that I want your mind to be jumping to when we're approaching this problem. And then we'll go over some formulas and terminology so that we can tackle this problem. All right, so now I want us to go through expansively going through a possibility set given n equals 2. In our little bubble here, we are able to use the numbers 1, we're able to use the number 2. So we're going to have two nodes. So my first choice is I need to choose a root number. When I choose 1 as the root, this is what happens. So when I choose 1 as the root, I cannot have anything on the left because I can't put 2 on the left. My bubble, my realm of possibilities. To put in the left subtree of 1, is none. Based on our possibility set, we can't have anything in this left subtree, and we've expanded all possibilities here. But here, now we have the possibility space of putting a 2 here. So what materializes from this is we're going to be able to create one's tree. So what is that tree? So what materialized from that possibility space was we put the 1 here, and then we have a cloud of 2, and then we can place the 2. So this is if we choose 1 as the root. We've expressed all possibilities of placements if we do 1 as the root. With 1 as the root, we can generate one tree. It's right there. And notice how when we go this way, we go greater in value. It's a binary search tree, maintain those properties. So we get one tree from planting one as the root. Let's plant two as the root. So we plant two as the root. So what is going to happen? What is going to be the branching of possibilities in our subtrees? This is what the possibility clouds will look like. And now we have a two rooted and this, this expression right here expresses all the possibilities with two at the root. All we can do is place the one in the right subtree and the left subtree has no possibilities to expand. So now this is what we get. So this is our answer. This is the only structurally unique binary search tree we can make given the numbers one and two if we plant two at the root and now we have another tree. And notice that's our answer, our answer is two. The answer for the second Catalan number is going to be two because we can generate two structurally unique binary search trees. So now let's expand our pool and let's expand to the number three and see how that changes how we do things. So now n is three and I have the three numbers one, two, and three. I can plant each at the root of my binary search tree and then I know the possibility spaces that will result from that choice. So we choose one as the root and let's see what happens. We chose one and an expression of all of the possibility space. If I choose one, I have a cloud here where I can put two or three at this node. I can choose either because I will maintain the binary search tree property. If I go right, I can choose either of those at this node. There is nothing I can choose there. I cannot go lesser in value because the sequence starts at one. So. If I place one at the root, this is my new possibility space. And notice I have two choices from here. What do I do? I will materialize both of those choices. I will yield two trees from this. So let's see what happens. And now we have materialized this possibility space. We have expressed both choices of two and three at that node. And therefore we have maintained our BST property and I yield two trees from a placement of one at the root. So now let's place two at the root. 
And now I have placed two at the root. I have a one on the left, and I need to express all of those possibilities, and I have a three on the right. So now, what I do is I materialize those possibilities. At each of these places, we only can make one choice, so I will materialize only one possibility from this. So now, all I can do is materialize this. All I can do is get a two planted at the root, and have a one on the left, and a three on the right. And now, with two rooted at the root, I know that I will yield one tree. So now, let's root three at the root. And now I have put three at the root. Notice my right subtree has no things I can put in it. I'm going from one to three. I do not have any choices for that node right there. But for this node, I can choose the one or the two. So let's materialize each possibility. So now I see when I have three rooted at the root of a tree where I can use three nodes, I know the answer is I can generate two structurally unique binary search trees. And now, and now you see we have five. And notice each of these are subproblems. And when we see subproblems, what does that remind me of? What does that make me think? It makes me think I can save these answers. I can use dynamic programming. That is why this question turns out to be dynamic programming, because each of these is a subproblem. This subproblem's answer is two. What was the question? If I plant one at the root and I have three nodes going from one to three, what is the answer? Two. If I plant two at the root and I have three nodes, what is the answer? One. If I plant three at the root and I have three nodes, what is the answer? Two. So we are going to be subproblem'ing down and to answer the nth Catalan number, we are going to be building up our answers, remembering past answers, and then we are going to build up to our greater solution. So now let's go into how we do that. So we started our understanding at intuitions. We knew how a binary search tree worked. We knew when we place an element at the root, we're going to narrow how we can build trees. So now let's formalize our ideas into equations so that we can understand mathematically how these subproblems relate. So first, let's define something. So now let's define G of N. So g of n is going to be the formula for the nth Catalan number. It is the original question we are asking. Given numbers 1 to n, how many structurally unique binary search trees can we build? This is the overall question. I can place 1 at the root. I can place 2 at the root. I can place 3 at the root if n is 3. It is giving us from 1 to n. So now let's define another equation that helps us understand what g of n means. So now let's define the function f of i and n. So with i at the root and n nodes available, how many structurally unique binary search trees can I build? So the answer to g of n is the sum if I plant the 1, the 2, the 3, and up to n at the root. So if g is 3, I have 1, 2, and 3 to work with. I can plant 1 at the root. I can plant two at the root. I can plant three at the root. And each time I have three nodes total to work with. So the answer to G of three is going to be the sum between these three plantings when we plant the one, the two, and three and explore all of those possibilities. So how does this break down? What does this look like as we build our possibilities through the tree? So now, this is what the breakdown looks like. We're not changing anything we did. This is exactly what we did before. We have g of three. Our original question is for the third Catalan number. So we plant one, we plant two, and we plant three. But then, what are the left and right subtrees? What is their possibility space after we make this choice? So now let's express that. So this is a huge mental leap I need you to make. So when we go left here, when we plant one at the root, we can have nothing in the left subtree. All the expressions are going to be g of zero. We'll have zero nodes to work with. In this subtree, we will have two nodes. We'll have the two and the three to work with. So therefore, the amount of ways we can go from here is g of two. We have two nodes. We need all the unique placements within that subtree. And that is going to express all of this. And notice, this continues to branch down. We solve g of two by breaking it down here. So we're going to solve this 
by breaking it down again into summations. So, moving on. We know we can use the one in the left subtree if we plant two at the root. We know we can use three in the right subtree if we plant two at the root. We have one node to work with, g of one. One node to work with, g of one. And then, if we plant three at the root, we have two nodes to work with in the left subtree, one and two, and we have zero nodes to work with in the right subtree because three is the maximum. We only have three nodes, one, two, three. So now, these are the key equations. And guess what? We already know the answer to g of zero, just one. We already know the answer to g of one. It's just going to be one. So this is how the subproblems break down. And it yields us a key equation that brings us straight to coding it. So finally, this is how we do our dynamic programming. The code is in the description. Now the code will make sense. And you can see how the subproblems relate. The answer to f planting at i on the root and having n nodes available, the answer is the product. This is actually called the Cartesian product because we are taking all of the cross sections between two possibility spaces, two possibility spaces, we take the Cartesian product between them. And what happens is we take the product between g of i minus one, which we just take one minus one and we get zero. And then n minus i, if n is three and I subtract one from three, I have two left. So now g of two, so all this is doing is saying left subtree possibilities, right subtree possibilities. Multiply them to take all the cross section between the possibilities, and that gives us all of these structurally unique binary search trees we can build given that we rooted at this specific element. This is the final intellectual jump you need to make to fully understand this problem and how the dynamic programming gives us the answer to this global solution. This is the bigger picture of this question. So if I plant a two at the root and n equals three, I planted a two at the root. The reason I subtract one is because I can go from one up to the two minus one because we're going to the left. It's a binary search tree. We need to go down in value. And if I go to the right, we subtract from our upper bound. We know that n minus the two is going to yield us the amount of nodes we can work in the right subtree because that gives us our upper bound, our right bound. So now that we see the bigger picture, and again, you don't need to immediately internalize this, but this is the bigger picture I want you to understand. Let's look at the time and space complexity to this solution. So we're going to let n be the input n, and the time complexity is going to be big O of n squared. But don't ever be fooled when you see O of n squared. That does not mean for every single n we do n iterations. The thing is, it might be a triangular sort of work where we drop a constant. Maybe it's like one half n squared. There's a much more detailed and mathematical analysis of the time in the description below provided by leak code. I don't want to go into it here because I probably explained it wrong. But our time complexity is going to round to n squared. And then our space complexity is going to be linear. We are going to be storing the solution to n plus one subproblems. If you count the zero with subproblem, if you don't, we're just storing n subproblems. Either way, it does not matter. We will scale in a linear fashion as the input size, the n gets arbitrarily large for this problem. So these are the time and space complexities. If this video helped you, if this was a clear explanation, subscribe to the channel and like this video. These are for you to prepare for the software engineering interview and to just excel in it and do well. So subscribe to the channel, like the video and